So the last part of this chapter contains this little story that is so beautiful, uh, involving Mary and her sister Martha. These are the two sisters of Lazarus. They live in Bethany, which is just up and over the Mount of Olives on the east side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. So it's as you're headed on the, the beginning part of your journey, if you're headed down towards Jericho, first uh, city you'd come to on the other side would be Bethany. The Hebrew meaning of that town is the house of the poor, so it seems like it's not a super wealthy place, and it's interesting, this is where Jesus seems to spend his time when he's in Jerusalem, not in Jerusalem teaching, but it's at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, among the poor. Yeah, so let's pick up the details here in verse 38, starting in verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. So there's some sense of, of responsibility and ownership here uh, resting on Martha. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word but Martha was cumbered about much serving. Let's pause there for a minute. Can you all picture in your mind's eye this scenario? Jesus comes to Martha's house. Can you picture this, this flurry of excitement of, oh, Jesus, welcome, and can you picture Martha now running around the front room, uh, straightening the pillows, getting everything ready, here, come and sit down right here, and Jesus sits down, and then Martha runs to the kitchen, to start preparing some refreshments, some food. If, if Jesus has come to their house from Jericho, we, we don't know whether he came from Jerusalem or from Jericho or from somewhere else, but if he did, if he was headed towards Jerusalem and he was coming up from Jericho, then when he arrives at Martha's house, it's been a long, steep hike that day, 15 miles roughly, gaining 3,500 feet, they would be exhausted if that's the, the route that they were coming from. So you can picture Martha's uh, desire to make him feel comfortable regardless of, of which direction he's come to her house. And then in your mind's eye, can you picture Mary? Mary seems to just be sitting at the feet of Jesus, just absorbing this moment, having, having this wonderful connection probably asking him questions, probably listening intently, asking, how's your mother, how are your siblings, and, and, and just enjoying that moment, and in the background you can picture Martha running around the kitchen. And then it says, she came to him and she said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now pause right there for a moment and ask yourself the question, how would I feel if I were Mary? I've been sitting there with this connection with Jesus and all of a sudden my sister Martha came out and said, Lord, well, basically why are you letting her sit there? She's being lazy. Bid her, get her to get up and come and help me so we can get the food and the drink and we can come out here and we can all sit down and enjoy your presence together. Have you noticed a pattern in the New Testament? Anytime anybody comes to Jesus pointing a finger of accusation or scorn or judgment towards anybody else, and it doesn't matter what the judgment is, anytime a finger of judgment is being pointed, Jesus not once in the New Testament turns to the finger pointer or the accuser or the person who's doing the judging and says, oh, thank you, thank you for making me aware of what that person's doing, I, yes, you're right, and then turn to the person who's being accused and rebuke them or accuse them. Not once. Jesus, as the great intercessor or mediator, regardless of what the accusation is, he gets between them, and he always turns it back to the person doing the finger pointing. And in this case, he doesn't tell Mary, you're right, Martha, <laughs> Mary, you, you, you should go and help your sister. It's, it's really rude for you to sit here. He doesn't do that. Instead, 
he turns to Martha and he says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now let's pause here because if, if you look at this story through the history of time, and if you were to ask most people through the, the past centuries, how would you rate Mary and Martha? Most people would say, oh, Mary's great and Martha's sub-great. She's less than Mary. She's not good. Um, that's how many people have interpreted these two women based on this telling of the story. Can we just tap the brakes for a moment and say, hmm, let's pretend for a moment. Let's shift the story. Let's pretend that Jesus is sitting there talking to Mary, sitting at his feet, having this beautiful moment of connection. Martha's clamoring away in the kitchen making some noise, getting some refreshment ready. What would have happened if Mary had said, wait, wait a minute, Lord, why are you letting my sister be so rude and make this noise instead of actually coming and connecting with you so that we could make that connection and afterwards we'll both go together and get the refreshment taken care of? What? Why don't you bid her come and sit down and, and, and make this connection with you? Do you think that the next verse would have said, and Jesus turned to Martha and said, Martha, Martha, you're, you're cumbered about much serving, but Mary here hath chosen the better part. Or do you think Jesus might have had some words of correction for Mary? I don't know because that scenario doesn't show up, so we're just guessing here. But my hunch is that one of the better parts, there are a couple of potential answers for what the better part is, that uh, the, or the good part that Mary chose, and um, perhaps one of the ways to interpret the good part is to say Mary was comfortable being Mary and she didn't feel the need to try to make Jesus change Martha into becoming more like Mary. Perhaps allowing people to serve or to sit and connect with Jesus or to be who they naturally and inherently are, perhaps there's, there's power in that. So this chapter is about service, if that hasn't been apparent by now. We all have the need to be served by Jesus, by those around us, and by invitation to be like Jesus, to serve others. And we all have different capacities for serving. And I love that, that quote from Pat Holland, that all of us have opportunity capacity to serve and we can do it in ways that are natural to us and it's okay if we aren't serving like everybody who might be around us. Like the Good Samaritan, all of us can be on the lookout to see people who have a need to be served and we can participate being on that covenant path, loving our neighbor, and by so doing, showing that we love God. I love that. And as we conclude this story, keep in mind, Mary and Martha are going to come into future uh, scripture chapters that we're going to read, and you're going to see how much Jesus loves both Mary and Martha and how this is not a defining moment that condemns or relegates Martha to a second-level standing for the rest of her life. This is a learning experience for Martha, and it's beautiful, and we can learn from that. Jesus isn't trying to change Martha to be more like Mary any more than he's trying to change Mary to become more like Martha. He's trying to change both of them to become more like him. And in closing, Sister Holland's uh, final words on this, on this subject, she says, somewhere, somehow, the Lord blipped the message onto my screen that my personality was created to fit precisely the mission and talents he gave me. Our invitation is to not look horizontally in comparison with other people and their personalities and their gifts and their talents and their opportunities but to rather look heavenward and say, Lord, here I am. You gave me a very unique uh, set of gifts and talents and missions 
to fulfill in this life, help me, shape me to be able to, to be the best version of me that I can possibly be with thy help. And his promise is pretty sure that he will guide us and he will shape us when we give, give our life to him. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness.